So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Um, and uh, also thank them for putting together this very nice uh, program in here. I have enjoyed very much uh, the time uh, spent at uh, IHES and benefited from it. Um, the uh, topic of, of my lectures is uh, uh, two-dimensional water waves. And for, for those of you who are not familiar with the subject, water waves are the waves that you see forming on the surface of, uh, of the water. Um, and uh, of course, are the fluids, but most importantly, uh, it's, it's water that uh, we have in mind here. Now, when you think about uh, water waves, you will uh, most naturally think about uh, water waves in, our, in the physical space. In uh, three space dimensions. The two-dimensional water wave equations uh, would be, you could think of those as, for instance, uh, three-dimensional water waves which do not depend on, on one of the variables. So there are special cases of, of three-dimensional water waves. Um, maybe uh, I owe you a bit of an explanation why, why am I talking about two-dimensional water waves and not uh, about also higher-dimensional water waves. Um, uh, and uh, fortunately, some some of that, uh, uh, some of the motivation for that was already uh, given in uh, uh, Nader Masmoudi's uh, talks. Uh, there, are, there are significant differences between uh, two and three dimensions uh, when you look at fluids, uh, and particularly as far as the uh, problems uh, that I will try to tell you about uh, are concerned. Two-dimensional water waves and three-dimensional water waves are very different, both in the way you set up your equations and in, in the kind of uh, um, issues that you, you, you are facing uh, uh, in, in the analysis. What is common, though, between two-dimensional water waves and three-dimensional water waves is the large set of problems that you want to look at. And uh, later today, I'll spend some time uh, trying to uh, give you an overview of uh, maybe what are, in my view, the interesting problems. Uh, those are the same for two-dimensional and three-dimensional water waves, but uh, other than that, the, the uh, setting, uh, uh, the setup of the equations is different, and, and the uh, technical issues that you you face um, uh, are, are different. Now, uh, the work that I'll tell you about um, is uh, uh, collaborative work, um, and uh, my uh, Collaborators uh, for 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 the stuff uh, are first of all um, uh, Mihaila Efrim for all of the stuff that I will tell you about, and then for some portions of uh, uh, of this work, um, two other collaborators, John Hunter. Uh, and then Benjamin Harrop Griffiths. Mm. There's an S here at the end. Uh, sometimes I forget to write it, but this time it just doesn't fit. Um, um, and, and uh, just for your curiosity, uh, John was Mihaela's PhD advisor, and Ben uh, was my, my graduate student. All right, so uh, I'm not going to assume you know about water waves, and I'll try to give you some idea of uh, where the equations come from. But I will not be able to do complete computations for, for uh, time restrictions. And so, um, if you will want to see more details, I'll, I'll tell you where, where to, to look. Um, and uh, maybe just to, to start with, uh, for a general introduction to, to the subject, there are two recent books that I would, uh, would recommend. Um, 
So um, one one book which is devoted to uh, to uh, water wave uh, equations uh, uh, to to their sort of general analysis is the book of David Land. And another book, uh, but both books have appeared within the last uh, two, or two or three years. And another book which is uh, devoted to an, uh, more to a topic that I will not touch very much, but which is uh, very hot if you want in connection to water waves, the topic of, uh, of traveling waves, of uh, solitons if you want. Um, and that's a book of, uh, by Adrian Constantin. Of course, there are lots of other books on the subject, but these are, are, are two of the most recent, and, and they uh, somehow tie into what I'll have to tell you. And if you have know nothing about water waves, reading maybe the first chapter in each book will give you some idea uh, about uh, what, what the problems are. We can now have to figure out the boards. So there are two on the side, right? Yeah. And three in the middle. All right. It doesn't go any higher. In any case. Uh, so, uh, uh, before I, I tell you about uh, water waves, I have to, to start with the uh, incompressible Euler equations. So, uh, this, the incompressible <laughs> Euler equations will model the evolution of an uh, incompressible fluid. Uh, my main variable will be capital U, which is going to be the velocity. Here, for, for now, the dimension doesn't matter very much. Uh, and then the equations for U will be UT plus U dot gradient of U uh, is equal to um, minus gradient of P. Uh, minus, uh, and here I'll introduce the uh, letter, small letter G for gravity, uh, J, where J is the uh, unit vector point in, in the uh, vertical direction. Um, maybe that's a specific notation for two dimensions. And uh, the picture that uh, we'll have in mind uh, is uh, so, so, so this would be, and, and of course we have the divergence-free uh, condition, which is related to the incompressibility. All right, and so if you are looking at uh, Euler equations in uh, all of uh, R two or all of R n, these are the equations that you have to consider. Uh, but now the picture that uh, we'll uh, look at will be instead the picture where the water does not cover all of R2 or all of Rn, but instead what you have is some free surface, which is the interface between water and air. So this is air and this is water. And maybe here you also have a bottom, right? Um, and so now the function u that describes the velocity of the fluid is defined in this uh, region between the water-air interface and the bottom. Let's call this region omega of t. So uh, this region will depend on t because the interface between air and water will move. And let me call this interface gamma of t. And so now u is a function from uh, omega of t into and let me stick with the two dimensions, which is what I want to uh, talk about in, 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 in two dimensions, the uh, velocity field. And so now, once you, when you try to set up your problem in a domain like this, you're going to have boundary conditions. Uh, and you're going to have boundary conditions on the top and boundary conditions on the bottom. And the um, interesting boundary conditions are on the top, but just to, to get uh, this out of the way, let me uh, say one word about the bottom. Uh, 
So here we're simply assuming that the fluid does not penetrate the bottom. Uh, and what this means about the velocity vector field is that when you are on the bottom, the velocity vector field has to be tangent to the bottom. So this means that u is tangent to the bottom. And then the second, now a set of boundary conditions, uh, the interesting ones happen on the top. <coughs> All right, and on the top you have uh, uh, two boundary conditions. Um, and, and th they have names. Uh, uh, one will be what is called the kinematic boundary condition. And this kinematic boundary condition has to do with how the free interface between the water and air moves. So this, this moves with respect to time, but now what happens with the particles which are on the surface at some given time? Will they go inside the fluid or, or will they stay on top? And the kinematic boundary conditions, the kinematic boundary condition tells you that particles which are initially on the top, they stay on the top, uh, they stay on the interface. So uh, in other words, uh, the interface Uh, if you want, uh, moves with velocity and later on we'll also write down a, a formula for this but, but for now let's uh, uh, just uh, keep this very simple interpretation in mind and then uh, there is the second boundary condition that's what we call a dynamic boundary condition and this uh, dynamic boundary condition um, if you want is uh, nothing but uh, the, the balance of forces uh, on the um, surface of the fluid uh, precisely um, uh, the air will have a certain pressure uh, atmospheric pressure uh, and then the water will have uh, a different pressure and you'd expect this two pressures to be equal right uh, and that's usually the case unless you also assume that uh, there is a surface tension at the surface of the water. Now what does the surface tension do? The surface tension tries to keep the um, surface of the water flat. Okay, So if the surface of the water is very curved then the surface tension will try to flatten it. And so what will matter in terms of the surface tension is the curvature uh, um, of, of the water surface and so uh, the relation and let me sure get sure let me make sure I, I, I get the correct signs the relation is that the P P will be the pressure of the fluid is equal to P naught P naught will be the atmospheric pressure and uh, if you have surface tension uh, then here you have to add the effect of the surface tension sigma H. Sigma plays the role of a surface tension coefficient. So let me say uh, uh, <coughs> sigma and, and since I'm making uh, uh, let me also write down G which is the other important parameter in our analysis. This is graph Okay, and then uh, H will denote the mean curvature of gamma of t. All right, so we have the evolution inside given by the incompressible oil equations together with the three boundary conditions, one boundary condition on the bottom and uh, two boundary conditions on the top. We're not yet at water waves. Uh, uh, this is uh, if you want full fluid equations. Uh, and when you, when you look at this uh, evolution, you have to track two things really. You have to track the evolution of uh, uh, the velocity field inside the domain, but you also have to track the evolution of the domain, uh, the evolution of this free boundary. This is uh, not an easy problem and uh, um, 
there are, there are people in the audience who, who, have, who have studied this problem or possessedness of this problem. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Hans Limblad, uh, uh, Limblad and uh, Christo Dulu, um, then Coutard and Scholar, uh, uh, David Lan, whose book I, I mentioned. So, so there, there's been work on this, but this will not be uh, what I want to tell you about. Instead, what we'll do to get to water waves, we're going to specialize to one class of flows, and maybe I can I can put something more on, on this uh, on this board. So one uh, object that plays an important role in uh, the analysis of two-dimensional flows, uh, and also three-dimensionals, but even more in two-dimensional flows, is the vorticity. So if omega is the vorticity, this curl of u then the vorticity will solve a transport equation. Uh, this is a scalar function. So omega t plus u dot gradient of omega is equal to 0. So omega is transported along the fluid flow. And so uh, this uh, leads us to an important class of, uh, um, of fluids, and those are the um, uh, irrotational fluids. So omega is equal to zero. That's what we call irrotational. And these are the class of flows that I want to really tell you about. Let's see. Okay. So. Uh, All right, so when you look at an irrotational flow, you have two relations which are satisfied by the velocity vector field u. One is that the divergence of u is equal to 0, and the other one is that curl of u is equal to 0. And so clearly the two components of u uh, are not independent. Uh, and uh, what one usually does in, in a situation like this is you, you try to characterize the two components of u, which are not independent, by a single scalar function. And that's what's called the velocity potential. Uh, and so this is a scalar function phi. Uh, if you want, phi will, uh, in our setting there, will be defined from omega of t with values in r. You can define this at uh, every uh, uh, time. And this is defined so that the function u is equal to gradient of phi. Now, um, there's another function that one, uh, another scalar function that uh, one can associate to, uh, to a flow, even if it's not irrotational. And this will also play a role in my discussion, so let me introduce it here. That's what's called the stream function. And we're going to denote that by capital theta. And so this is defined so that u is the gradient perpendicular of theta. This is in uh, two, two dimensions. And so once your velocity vector field is represented in terms of uh, the velocity potential, then it's natural that you, will, uh, you can try to write down the, your equations in terms of the uh, velocity potential. Now, if you look at the definition of the uh, uh, velocity potential, and you remember that divergence of u is equal to 0, then for the function phi, uh, for the velocity potential, you're going to get a Laplace equation. So. phi will be Laplacian of phi is equal to 0 in omega of t. And if uh, the fluid happens to have a bottom, um, and, and some of the stuff that I'll tell you about the fluid will have a bottom, and in some stuff I'll tell you the fluid will have an, uh, an infinite bottom, so there's no such boundary condition. But if there is one such, then what is the corresponding boundary condition for, for phi? 
Uh, and uh, since uh, all, all these hypotheses are invariant with respect to rotations, it's not hard to see that uh, what uh, the, the reflection of our uh, of our first boundary condition on the bottom, that u is tangent to the bottom, uh, is simply the fact that d phi dn, the normal derivative of phi, is equal to zero on the bottom. Okay, so we have a harmonic function in the domain, satisfies a Neumann boundary condition on the bottom, and so this means by standard elliptic theory that the function phi is actually determined by its values on the top. Okay, so if I know phi restricted to gamma of t, that will tell me what is phi restricted to uh, the entire domain omega of t. All right, um, and so um, once you have this piece of information, it's very natural to think of uh, the evolution really as the evolution of the top. So. Um, if you want, um, if you look at water waves, you don't need to look at the entire fluid body, but instead you want to look just at the interface between fluid and water. And here you're going to have two, two variables if you want. One variable which is the interface gamma of t between the fluid and the water. And the other variable is the velocity potential phi restricted to gamma of t. Okay? And if you have these two pieces of information at any given time, then you should be able to compute the velocity at that given time, and you should be able to see how in turn these two quantities vary in time. So my first goal for you would be to show you that this actually happens and how we can write down the equations for gamma of t and phi. And uh, for the moment, uh, uh, let me stick to what is called the Eulerian formulation of the problem. Um, and I will assume that the interface gamma of t is a graph, and that this graph can be written as a function. So y, which is the height, is eta of x. Okay? And then let me call the restriction of phi to the free boundary to be called C. So Psi will be now a function of x because the um, free boundary is parametrized by x. Okay? So now we have this set of two functions, eta and Psi, and we want to see uh, what is the evolution equation for, for these two guys. All right, and so um, the evolution equation for uh, eta and psi uh, will come from the two boundary conditions that I have shown you before on the top. You have the kinematic boundary condition, the dynamic boundary condition. Uh, and we, we want to see what is the system of equations for eta and psi. And now, uh, if you look at the relation, uh, and, and, and I, I'm not going to uh, do the full computation here, I'm just planning to wave my hands a little bit, uh, but I'll tell you why. Um, so, w why, why you get the equations that I'll, I'll write in a moment. So, um, if you look at uh, the definition of u at the velocity vector field in terms of, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, the velocity potential, you see that it requires the full gradient of the velocity potential. Now, if the initial data that I give you is just the restriction of the velocity potential to the free boundary, that by itself does not give you the full gradient, right? If you want to get the full gradient of phi, you also need to know what is the normal derivative of phi restricted to the, phi to, to the free boundary. Uh, how do you get the normal derivative of phi? Well, you solve the Laplace equation with this boundary condition on top and the Neumann boundary condition on the bottom, and that will give you the, Neumann, the, the normal derivative of phi. And this operator that takes you from phi to the normal derivative of phi is a very important object in this story. It's called the Dirichlet to Neumann map associated to the domain omega of t. So, OK. 
Okay. Um, let me make sure I have sort of consistent notations. Um, so um, uh, I'll use the uh, the letter G for this. So G uh, takes um, the function phi restricted to uh, gamma of t, which we denoted by psi, into G of psi, which is the normal derivative uh, of uh, phi uh, restricted to gamma of t. All right. Um, what kind of operator is this operator G? Um, and and it, it's clear that it's not going to be such a, a simple operator to, to deal with because the domain is not a simple domain. You have one boundary that you don't know. So G, in particular, depends on what the domain is, of course. Um, so it's G of eta, really. Uh, so it, it depends on one of your unknown functions. And furthermore, G is not a differential operator, it's a non-local operator. And if you want to think of this in microlocal terms, it'll be a pseudo-differential operator of order one. And in a suitable setting, you can think of G as being like absolute value of T. But this, of course, will depend very much on how you parameterize your, your free boundary. So let me not use the equal sign here. Uh, but that's a good starting point if you want for this. You have to keep in mind that the G depends on, uh, uh, on the function eta. All right. So once we have this Dirichlet to Neumann map, you can write down uh, what uh, those uh, uh, kinematic and the dynamic boundary conditions mean. And let me start with the dynamic boundary conditions. And that's for a very simple reason. Um, in terms of the dynamic boundary conditions, uh, actually before you get to the dynamic boundary conditions, you look at the expressions in the incompressible Euler equations. And you see that uh, in this context of irrotational flows, you can write down each of these expressions in here as a gradient. right? So this will be the gradient of phi. This will be the gradient essentially of phi square. Uh, this will be the gradient, is the gradient of p. This will be the gradient of the y function. So if all of these expressions in here are gradients, this means that you can integrate this equation. And so if you um, integrate the Euler equation, then what you're going to get um, is what's called the uh, Bernoulli equation. All right. Uh, and the Bernoulli equation, uh, and let me make sure I get all the signs right, um, is an equation for essentially for phi, uh, phi t uh, plus one half gradient phi square. Uh, plus y, y is the vertical variable, plus p is equal to 0. Um, and uh, you'll say, wh why am I setting this equal to 0? Uh, and uh, one, one thing that uh, you can be a little bit fast and loose when you talk about these equations is the constants. Um, and the reason for that is that, first of all, when you write the incompressible Euler equations, the constant in p is irrelevant, right? When you write, uh, therefore, the dynamic boundary condition in there, the constant in P uh, cannot have an intrinsic meaning. The constant in P0 cannot have an intrinsic meaning. So the constants you can essentially discard. Um, and so here, for a suitable choice of the pressure, you can set this equal to 0 if you want. Um, and now uh, the next thing you do is you combine this Bernoulli equation with the dynamic boundary condition, and you get one of, uh, of the two equations that uh, govern the motion of uh, uh, the interface and the velocity potential restricted to the interface. And yeah, did you decide that gravity is one once for all? Um, no, actually not. Thank you. Um, and I, I will not decide that gravity is one. So if I do this again, please correct me again. <laughs> um. All right. So 
so now I'm, I'm going to write for you the um, um, water wave system. And as I said, this is a system for, uh, for the evolution of uh, phi and eta. Uh, and let me make sure, again, I get the signs right. Um, Okay, so this is the evolution of eta. This is the equation that uh, gives you the kinematic boundary condition. It tells you that the interface moves uh, with the speed that's uh, um, uh, um, somehow given by the normal derivative. So this is the normal derivative of the um, of, of phi, of uh, the velocity potential. And then the second equation in here is the equation that you derive by combining the Bernoulli equations with uh, the dynamic boundary conditions. Um, but again, when you look at the Bernoulli equations, here you have the gradient of phi. Uh, uh, and so if you want to express this in terms of phi restricted to the boundary, uh, this will also involve the Dirichlet to Neumann map. You need the normal derivative of phi. And so the full expression that you get will be like this. <coughs> so this is psi t uh, minus sigma h of eta plus g uh, eta. Uh, so for, for now, I have incorporated the effect of uh, uh, the surface tension, the effect of gravity. Um, and now uh, the effect of, uh, um, if you want, the gradient of phi square combined with the pressure, uh, that gives um, <coughs> um, plus 1 half grad phi square and I'm worried that I'll run again out of space. Uh, so minus one half. Uh, and the expression that you get in here is um, grad phi grad eta. This is a dot product uh, plus g of eta uh, psi. Sorry, everything is psi in here. Psi square. And this gets divided by 1 plus grad eta square. OK? Um, so uh, this, this is what is called, and of course, to finish this, this is equal to 0. All right? So this is what is called the um, Eulerian formulation of the um, uh, water wave equations. So this is the equations I want to tell you about. Except I'm not going to use this uh, this uh, uh, formulation of the equations to, uh, to to look at water waves, and I'll uh, tell you in a moment why. All right. Um, so uh, before I, I go any further, um, I want to show you some uh, some features of uh, of this uh, uh, equation, and uh, really the. If you, want, if you want to do just one computation, the simplest computation that you could do, what you should look at is the linearization of these equations around zero. So zero means that your interface is flat and the velocity is zero. And then you want to compute this linearization. And this computation also helped me with uh, something else, uh, namely that um, hopefully you, you all know that uh, the incompressible Euler equations are not dispersive, but this is a program about dispersive equations. Uh, so when you, we compute this linearization, you're going to see that the linearized equations at least are dispersive, so then the nonlinear equations are also dispersive, which is very, very fortunate. Okay, so uh, what is the linearization of the first equation? Uh, well, uh, when uh, eta is uh, flat, then um, the uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map is exactly the absolute value of d. Okay, so the first equation becomes, uh, and I'll use, hope you'll forget, uh, f forgive me for using the same variables, um, eta t uh, minus d uh, c is equal to 0. 
So nicer operator, but still non-local. And from the second equation, psi t minus sigma. And now, what is uh, this uh, 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 mean curvature of the uh, of the free boundary. Of course, we're in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, the free curvature is uh, a curve. The, we're looking at the curvature of a curve. So that's just it, the curvature. And that will be essentially at the linear level, the second derivative of eta. So minus sigma uh, d2 of eta. And then plus g eta, the effect of gravity. And all the other terms that you see in here are at least quadratic. So we wouldn't care about them. Uh, so this is equal to 0. All right. Um, it's not so immediate if you want to, uh, to see what, uh, the, uh, what is the character of this equation. But one thing you can do is you can write down a second order uh, for eta. So I can write down the equation eta tt by simply differentiating this uh, equation one more, once more with respect to time. And this will be, uh, uh, well, uh, let me make sure I get my signs right. Um, uh, so uh, will be minus um, uh, sigma, uh, it will be uh, d cube uh, plus g uh, d of eta. And so if you look at the principal symbol of this uh, uh, associated to this equation in here, uh, let's use the letters tau and psi for the Fourier variables. Tau will be for the time Fourier variable. Xi will, xi will be for the space Fourier variables. Uh, what you're going to see in here is that the principal symbol for this will be tau square minus sigma xi cube minus g xi. Okay, so this is the principal. symbol. And so uh, the important thing in here is whether this vanishes or not, um, and whether the roots of this as a polynomial in tau are real. Okay? And it's a very simple analysis. If the roots are real, then your equation will be um, essentially a dispersive type equation, because uh, this uh, symbol is not a linear symbol. And if the roots are not real, then in principle this equation is going to be ill-posed. So to be more precise, uh, if you're on the leading role in this analysis, it's played by sigma, because it's, uh, xi cube is larger than xi. Uh, and so the first thing that you can say is that uh, if you want to have well-posedness, and this is well-posedness in any Sobolev space if you want, the first thing you need to know is that sigma is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. And then if you um, are in the special case when sigma is equal to 0, then g becomes important. And then you want g to be greater than or equal to 0. You also see in this computation that uh, the, the case when sigma and g are both equal to 0, when you have no gravity and no surface tension, is a very degenerate case. <coughs> So you can think of that as a case when these equations are indeed very weakly coupled. And that's a case where your equations are more like the incompressible Euler equations, where you're not really going to have uh, uh, much to say in terms of dispersion. So for the purpose of uh, this talk and the purpose of this program, therefore, I want to stick to the case when either sigma is uh, positive or sigma is 0 and g is positive. All right. Um, so this is one thing. Uh, the other uh, important object that uh, plays a role in this story uh, is um, um, <coughs> it has to do with the balance of forces on the surface of the water. Uh, and that's, that's really given by the balance of pressures. And then the object that plays a role there is the uh, normal derivative 
of the pressure. Okay. Um, and what role does does this play? Uh, well, you can think of. Uh, so I'm 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 going to give you two uh, two two motivations of why this is important and uh, what. Uh, uh, what, what role it plays in our story. So one motivation is the following, that if uh, uh, the normal derivative of the pressure uh, has uh, the wrong sign, then the water particles that are on top of the water are pushed somehow into, into the air. And you get what you might call turbulence. Uh, and uh, the water surface will not stay coherent, right? So um, that will tell you that from, from physical considerations that you need a certain, uh, pr the proper sign somehow for uh, the normal derivative of pressure so that the particles on top of the fluid are pressed into the fluid. They will not uh, uh, go out into, into the air. There is a, a second interpretation for this, uh, which has to do with the way uh, I wrote the uh, uh, linearized equations. So uh, if you look at uh, this uh, second term in here, in the case that the interface is flat, the pressure in the fluid is given exactly by gy. So this g plays the role of the normal derivative of the pressure, right? So if, if, if the interface is flat, if the velocity is zero, then g is exactly the normal derivative of the pressure. And I'll show you a little bit later that when you, compute, when you compute the linearized water wave equations, you're not going to get something like g in here in the principal symbol, but instead you're going to get something like d p d n, the normal derivative of the pressure. So everything that I said about g before really to, is not something that applies to G in general, but is something that applies to the normal derivative of the pressure. So especially if you have no surface tension, you care a lot about this sign condition, uh, about the normal derivative of the pressure having the correct sign. So um, let me make a, a choice in here. And of course, the choice that you make depends on what you define your normal. Uh, and I'm sure that if I start uh, caring about signs, uh, at some point I'm going to mess them up. So let me be a little bit fast and loose uh, with signs. <coughs> and so this is called the Taylor <coughs> sign condition. And so um, what uh, Taylor observed, uh, and uh, I, I think also some other people, but I, I, I don't... Uh, um, remember their names, is the following that at least if you look at the linearized equations, this is a necessary condition for, for well positiveness. So uh, not only that you, uh, so, so these equations, in other words, these equations will not be in general well posed unless you have um, something like this uh, Taylor sign condition. All right, so um, let's see the next issue that I would like to talk about a little bit. And I still want to keep uh, the Euler equations for now. Has to do with uh, the question of coordinates. So one thing that you already saw in uh, Nader's uh, uh, talks is that it's important when you look at uh, fluid problems to work in a proper frame of coordinates because some uh, uh, issues that may arise might just be a matter of uh, having a poor choice of coordinates. Similar issues arise in lots of other problems, for instance, in uh, general relativity, in really any, any problem that has some gauge uh, invariance where you need to to fix the gauge. And so uh, it also plays an important role here. And so the question is the following. We have uh, this system of equations which model the evolution of an interface and of uh, some function restricted to this interface. 
And the question is, how do I parameterize the interface? What is the best way to parameterize the interface? So how to And you already saw here implicitly one choice of such a parametrization, uh, and that's the Eulerian parametrization. And in the Eulerian parametrization, at each moment in time and each position in space, you look at uh, the values of phi and, uh, uh, and eta, or psi and eta, at that position, and you parameterize the, the surface eta, as I wrote it in there, in terms of the Euclidean coordinate y at any given time. There I should have written really y is eta of x and t, and everything will also, should also be a function of x and t. So you might say the Eulerian parameterization is the most natural one, uh, but we also know from other problems that not always the most natural parametrization is the best one for, for the problem. Uh, and another classical parametrization is the Lagrangian. And in Lagrangian coordinates, what you do is you fix a frame at the initial time, so you're going to have some initial configuration of the fluid. And then for each particle of the fluid, you move your frame according to the way the particle moves. So one, one, one big difference between the Eulerian and Lagrangian coordinates is that if you look at the, even the Euler equations in Eulerian coordinates, uh, you're going to see the transport equation, right? The transport along the vector field. But when you look at the Lagrangian coordinates, this transport disappears because this is built into the coordinates. So here you have transport, uh, but here you have no transport. So I might say, oh, we should go for Lagrangian coordinates, right? However, when you look at Lagrangian coordinates, what you do, wha what happens is as you move along the particle path, your frame of reference will be twisted, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, here you end up having to solve a Laplace equation. But if you solve a Laplace equation in a twisted frame, that's as if you were to solve a Laplace equation in variable coefficients. So uh, you need to, to do a lot of work to move this Laplacian from one coordinate frame to, to the other. So what you have gained in one place, you have lost in, in the other place. So here you have the disadvantage that you have a twisted or transported frame. So from this perspective, neither of these two coordinate systems uh, are ideal. And um, I will not tell you about either of these two coordinate frames. Uh, instead, I'll tell you about a third choice, which uh, is what I'll call uh, conformal or holomorphic. coordinates. And there's a, what is the motivation for, for, in the first place, for looking for another system of coordinates here? Uh, it's a very simple motivation, namely that if you look at these equations in here, the one object that seems maybe harder to, to grasp in here is the Dirichlet to Neumann map. It's non-local, pseudo-differential, variable coefficients, all of that. Is it possible to diagonalize the Dirichlet to Neumann map? It would be great if instead of having to work with the Dirichlet to Neumann map as a variable coefficient pseudo-differential operator, we could simply work with this operator. Okay? And so you ask, can I make a change of coordinates so that the Dirichlet to Neumann map becomes as simple as possible? And uh, the idea there is very simple. Uh, uh, namely, uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to save for now the board on the top. Oh, 
Okay. So the idea is that you can have your you have your fluid domain, which is omega of t, and you can conformally map this into a model domain, which could be a strip, maybe if you had the bottom, or could be a half plane if you did not have a bottom. Okay? And um, in two dimensions, such a map will exist, it will be a holomorphic map between uh, these two domains. It will be given by the Riemann mapping theorem. And so in this domain, you will know what the Dirichlet to Neumann map is. It will be a fixed object. It will not depend on anything, right? It will depend just on the choice of this domain. And as long as you keep this domain fixed, that's sort of a God-given object. Whereas here, it was dependent on your configuration. All right. Um, and so uh, this is uh, what I mean by uh, conformal coordinates. Um, historically, I think the conformal coordinates are maybe close to 100 years old. Um, and initially, um, they uh, maybe uh, uh, my uh, knowledge of history is incomplete, but as I understand it, initially conformal coordinates were used uh, in order to study special solutions to water wave equations, namely traveling waves. So traveling wave is a wave that keeps its profile over time, just moves with a constant speed. Um, there, were, um, there, there was also a second form of using the, uh, this uh, conformal coordinates. Uh, so implicitly in what I was telling you, the conformal coordinates are coordinates where the variable that changes uh, is, is, is the domain. So, uh, you're modeling the domain in a different way. But you, uh, and, and this means you're essentially you're working with the variable eta. But you can also sort of twist the roles of the variables eta and psi and work with psi uh, in modeling this change of coordinates. And then you get something that's called the hodograph transform. Okay? That's another way of, of looking at this uh, 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 conformal method. Uh, this, this is not something that I will... Uh, uh, mention about. And, and since I'm talking about the holomorphic coordinates, in terms of using the uh, uh, conformal coordinates to study the water wave equations, let me give you a few names. So the first, uh, that the first uh, reference that we found using this uh, conformal coordinates for water waves uh, is a Russian mathematician of, of Syanikov. Uh, that was in the 60s, uh, I think. Uh, possibly early 70s. Um, and then uh, independently, uh, uh, C.J. Wu and uh, uh, let me see, Diachenko Dia and Kuznetsov and Spector and Zaharov computed uh, the evolution of the two-dimensional water waves uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in conformal coordinates. Uh, they, uh, their booking keeping was uh, sort of different, um, and so they ended up with uh, slightly uh, different looking sets of equations. Uh, I think CJ wrote the equations more like a second order evolution in time, and uh, uh, the uh, Zakharov group, they wrote the equations uh, as a system more akin to, to this system that you see in here. But in any case, uh, the idea was there to um, exploit this uh, uh, conformal uh, invariance of the Laplacian in two space dimensions. Now, that brings me to an important remark here, which is that this method only works so nicely in two space dimensions, and that's one reason to, for me to stick to two space dimensions. So. So CJ also has some version of this that applies in, in uh, three space dimensions, but it's far less, uh, uh, in, in, I, th I think, far less intuitive and, and elegant, just because uh, it's in two dimensions that any two domains are uh, conformally equivalent. Okay.
All right, so um, so now that I, I, I got to describe for you a little bit the water wave equations, uh, what I want to briefly outline are what are I, I think of as the, the main problems that uh, are, are interesting to look at. And I, I should say from the beginning that there are lots and lots of interesting problems in here. Uh, I think we have only touched the uh, tip of the iceberg so far. Um, these problems are not easy, and you, you see some reasons why these problems are not easy, because on one hand your equations are, well, they are dispersive, they are fully nonlinear uh, equations. Um, they have some, uh, if you want, some gauge invariance. Uh, you have a number of parameters at your disposal, uh, the surface tension, the gravity, uh, you can throw in more parameters if you're not happy with this too. Uh, um, and uh, then you have also the matter of whether you have a bottom or not for, for your fluid. Uh, so lots of uh, freedom in choosing your, your equations. And, and this is why sometimes actually when you look at the literature, it's, it's, it's hard to say what is what, because people assume that uh, you know what they're talking about from the beginning. Uh, and it takes a while to, to place uh, uh, this or that result in, into the, the broader context. At least that's uh, one, one problem that I have uh, encountered. So, uh, so um, on my list of interesting questions, of course, um, the, the first uh, one for any PD you might want to look at is the question of local well posedness. Um, <coughs> and you can uh, uh, ask for the local well posedness in, uh, in many contexts. You can ask for local well posedness <coughs> for small data. You can ask for local well posedness for large data. You can ask for local postness in all of this uh, context that I have uh, discussed. Um, maybe one uh, uh, so interesting uh, uh, question in terms of local postness is to look at low regularity solutions and to try to understand what is uh, a good uh, uh, local theory for, for these problems. Um, then uh, the second question, once you have your local solutions, you can ask how long are these solutions lasting? Uh, and um, one uh, easier setup that one can consider to start with is what happens if you have small data. And what happens if you have small data, you expect your solutions to last longer in time. So maybe uh, lifespan bounds. for small data. Um, another uh, related question to this is the following. So I was just uh, telling you that these equations are dispersive, right? And so if you start with the input at some point, you expect, uh, like a concentrated input, you expect this uh, input to resolve into waves and these waves to travel in different directions, and there is some implicit uh, decay in this picture, right? Because one wave is spreading into many waves uh, and uh, decaying in time. And so, one common problem when you look at nonlinear equations is what is the game between uh, dispersive decay and uh, um, nonlinear growth? Uh, and so, uh, uh, taking this into account, an another question, interesting question in here would be uh, maybe to look at long time solutions for small and localized data. And notice that these two questions are uh, sort of different from each other because here you start your with your, your waves concentrated and they spread out. Whereas here, maybe you're not assuming that your wave is concentrated to start with, so interaction of waves can occur at later times. Um, and uh, can, can happen not at a single time, but at multiple times, depending on where your waves have originated. 
uh, you might ask here for something stronger, you might ask for global solutions, depending on the problem you're looking at, you might or might not get uh, global solutions. And of course, uh, the opposite of getting long-time solutions is the question of blow-up. And maybe uh, when uh, here, when, when I'll, I'll say a few words more about blow-up now, because I'll never say anything about it uh, again during this uh, lectures. So what are your enemies here in terms of blow-up? What, what are the things that could go wrong? And you know what could go wrong for a typical nonlinear PDE, which is that your, your solution grows, right? It grows and it loses regularity eventually. Um, so that would be an obvious enemy here. So growth, loss of regularity. But this is not all that could happen for water wave equations. Uh, something else that could happen for water wave is uh, something that you have surely experienced yourself going to the beach, which is that waves can overturn. Okay, so you can have uh, maybe a picture like this. where uh, the, the two waves will eventually touch and, and here is where you, when they touch you will lose uh, this uh, nice structure and you'll have some, some turbulence uh, appearing. Um, so this is what you might call splash uh, singularities and I'll, I will say something uh, about this uh, a little bit later. And finally there's one third enemy that you have to be aware of here. I was telling you that in order for the linearized equation at least to be well posed, you need to have this Taylor sign condition. And so uh, that's the third thing that you need to track, whether the Taylor sign condition remains satisfied or not. And what you um, expect is that, uh, well, at least my, my understanding of it is that when uh, at the point where the Taylor sign condition becomes violated, you get some instability of the water surface and you begin to see the, the white foam that you see when you go to, to the beach. Um, and um, so let me write here simply Taylor uh, where, where the sign of the normal derivative of the pressure goes wrong. So um, uh, you, you need to, to worry about these this three objects uh, um, uh, separately and this is a sort of a specific of, uh, of the water wave equations and I'll, I'll say something a little bit more about the splash and about the Taylor side condition, um, uh, maybe not much about uh, the growth and loss of regularity. Um, and maybe the last item on my list, um, and I should say last but not least because books have been written about it, um, is when you look at special solutions, tend to get a new chalk also. Uh, and here in the category of special solutions, I would include maybe two, two objects. Uh, one object would be tra uh, traveling waves, so solitary waves. Of course, solitary waves play a big role in the understanding of the long time term dynamics of any uh, dispersive equation which has them. Uh, some of the equations I will tell you about have solitary waves and some don't, and I will tell you which is what. Um, and uh, related, sort of, um, you can also look at waves, uh, and you can also look at waves which have angular crests and in particular one of the most famous solitary waves for uh, uh, the water wave equation has an angular crest is the so-called uh, Stokes wave which has an angle of 120 degrees on the top. I will also not say anything about this anymore but I saw that CJ will, will, tell, you, uh, will tell us maybe a lot more about uh, this topic. So, so, so this is uh, the, the list of uh, uh, questions and I'm sure if you think a little bit more about it you can add to it um, but the, the three things that I will touch in my talk are, are the first three so we're going to stick with the good solutions and not worry about what happens when they go bad. All right, 
Um, <clears throat> so I was telling you that Um, about the, my collaborators uh, for, for this work. Um, and uh, as I said, so far I think we have only touched the, the tip of the iceberg and so far we have looked at, at four different problems and at various times I'll say things about these four different problems. <coughs> so the first problem that uh, we, we, uh, we looked at are, is the problem of um, when you take the uh, um, surface tension equal to zero, uh, positive gravity, and uh, infinite bottom. And as it turns out, this was a good idea. Uh, because uh, this is the easiest of them all. We did not realize that at the time, so in some sense we got lucky. Um, the second, and, and, and this is uh, uh, joint work with, uh, imp uh, with uh, Mihaly Freeman, partially with uh, John Hunter. Um, second problem we looked at was when you reverse the roles, uh, sigma greater than zero, g uh, is equal to zero, and again, infinite bottom. Okay, and this is a joint work with uh, uh, Mihaela. The third problem we looked at, um, and uh, okay, in a, in a brilliant move I have just erased the Euler equations uh, one minute before I should have done it. Let uh, me just put uh, fancy equations here. Yeah. Uh, so, um, ah, but I still have that yes. board over there, yes. Uh, and so I was telling you about the role played by the vorticity and that the vorticity is transported along the flow. And I was also telling you that water waves are the uh, waves for which the vorticity is zero uh, because uh, that's where you can reduce the dynamics to how the top is moving. Uh, well, I lied a little bit about that. Um, th there's another simple model where you can still reduce the equations to the evolution of the top. And that's the case when the vorticity is a constant. It's constant throughout the fluid domain. And the reason for that is that if the vorticity is constant, then it will stay constant as time evolves. And then you can still do the same kind of analysis, introduce some sort of modified um, velocity potential, and still write down some equations very similar to those equations and reduce the, equation, the, the problem to, to the boundary. So this would be the case when sigma is equal to zero. Uh, you have uh, non-zero gravity, but now the uh, new, new, new twist is that um, you have constant vorticity. And again, you have infinite bottom. Okay? Um, and so these this two, as I said, are, are joint work with uh, Mihaela. And the last uh, uh, problem that we started to look at, um, and we actually we... Uh, finished the, the first paper in that direction just a couple of days ago, um, is the case when, again, you look at uh, uh, the gravity wave problem, but now you take a finite bottom. So um, th this uh, sort of uh, completes the circle back to, to the first project because you can think of the infinite bottom problem as a limit of the finite bottom problem as the depth goes to infinity. And um, in effect, one, one of the things we were very careful about when looking at the uh, finite bottom problem was that the results that we prove are uniform as the depth of the fluid goes to infinity so that you recover results here as a limit of the results here. So this is uh, 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 something that uh, we don't think was, was uh, really done before. Um, and in uh, David Land's book, this is listed as one of the uh, the interesting problem. Of course, we were not proving ev everything about that, but still we, we made sure that whatever we proved uh, survives in the uh, infinite uh, depth limit. All right. Um, and 
uh, I, I should say one thing. Uh, what is that differentiate these problems? What are some of this, why are some of these problems easier and some of these problems harder? Uh, and uh, I will, uh, I'll say one word about this. Um, well, I'll say a couple of things about this. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, um, the, the enemies that you face, and uh, maybe one, one thing to consider is the Taylor sign condition. Um, so the question is whether uh, you a priori have a Taylor sign condition satisfied in these problems. Um, and uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, in the case of uh, infinite bottom, uh, with the gravity waves, uh, we know that the Taylor sign condition always holds. Uh, this is uh, a result of uh, C.J. Wu. Uh, what is the size? No, this is the infinite bottom. No, no, uh, for uh, the size of the in, in, Independently of the size of the data, yes. Uh, and in effect, when you look at, uh, 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 at the surface tension, but uh, even with or without gravity, uh, the proof of the Taylor sign condition remains the same. So all that really matters here is that you have an infinite bottom. Um, so as I said, uh, CJ uh, gave the first proof of this. Uh, and uh, uh, what we ended up doing is, to, is giving an alternate proof of this. And you can think of the two proofs uh, as one happening in the physical space and the, our, our proof happening in the, on the Fourier side of things. Um, the problem with constant vorticity, um, at least if the vorticity becomes large, we don't know that the Taylor sign conditions uh, stay satisfied. So uh, who knows what happens? Maybe somebody will prove it later, but uh, at least we were not able to prove it, at least not unless maybe C is, is very small. Um, uh, by the way, so... The, uh, Still coming back to this problem, there's what you, you might ask wh where do, do such uh, uh, waves uh, occur? Uh, why, why are they interesting? And at least uh, according to uh, something that I read uh, by uh, Adrian Konstantin, he claims that such waves occur uh, when you have uh, some tidal action on, uh, on your fluid. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, fourth case when you have finite bottom, uh, uh, and uh, uh, then it doesn't matter what you put in here. Um, you can ask the same question, and this the question becomes different from the question in infinite bottom. Um, and so we were very happy to be able to, to, to give a proof of this Taylor sign condition. Uh, and then we discovered that uh, actually a proof was given before by, uh, by David Lan. Um, fortunately, our proof is different. Uh, and also seems to be more, more general. It applies in a, a, a broader context. Uh, so one, one question that one can ask in terms of, uh, uh, of this uh, Taylor sign condition is whether the Taylor sign condition holds uh, even if your interface is self-intersecting. Uh, and our proof being Fourier analysis based has nothing to do with the interface uh, self-intersecting, whereas the other proofs uh, in the physical space do use this uh, uh, properties of, uh, of the interface. So in other words, we can consider waves that go like this and still know that the Taylor sign condition uh, is satisfied. Now what is the meaning of that? Uh, I will leave it to your imagination. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention in terms of all of these problems is that you can consider, oh, two, two more things actually. Uh, two more things. So um, the, the next thing that I was telling you that is important in the long time analysis of these problems is whether you have solitons or not, and in particular whether you can have small solitons. And uh, the first two problems turns out they do not have small solitons. The first one doesn't have any solitons at all. We don't know whether the second one has small sol uh, large solitons, or not, but definitely does not have small solitons. These two other problems, and I'll comment on this later, have small solitons. So in particular, you cannot hope to prove that you have uh, maybe global solutions which uh, uh, are dispersing uh, 
as time goes to infinity because some solitons might emerge in there. And the, the last thing that I wanted to, to mention today in terms of these uh, problems is that uh, even as, as listed, you can still consider them in two varieties and people have considered them in two varieties. One could look at periodic problems and non-periodic problems. versus non-periodic. So periodic means you look at the problem, say, on, uh, on the torus, and non-periodic you look at the problems on, on the real line. And you're going to see some uh, differences. For instance, uh, even this problem will have solitons if you look at it in the periodic case, but no solitons if you look at it uh, on the entire uh, real line. And of course, when you look at the periodic problem, you're not going to worry about this picture anymore because your domain is periodic, so what goes out comes back in. Um, you cannot expect uh, the dispersion mechanism to be so strong. All right, um, so I will uh, continue next time. Thank you. comments? Yes, sorry. Are there any particular assumptions you make on the bottom of your fluid? Like, does it have to be smooth or does it have to be flat? Or? Uh, in uh, all the work that I will tell you about, we'll assume that the bottom is actually flat. So, I as you see, there's one, one single case in here where we, we assume that there's a bottom, and we're assuming that the bottom is flat. And th there's a reason for that, because we want to look at the long time dynamics of the solutions. Um, and uh, a bottom that's not flat will mess that up. If you want to look just at the local or Poznan's problem, the shape of the bottom is meaningless. If you want to look at long time dynamics, uh, having perturbations on the bottom will uh, affect your, uh, the low frequencies in your flow. Uh, other questions? Uh, uh, yes, I had one, in fact. Uh, uh, in the case where you have small soliton, uh, is there a situation where at a formal level uh, people, or even rigorous level, uh, even better, Long time dynamics near one soliton, you start close to a soliton? Um, I, I think it's a, there's a vast literature in that direction, okay. uh, which I'm not all familiar with it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more stuff done at the linearized level, so linearized. looking at the linearization around solitons, okay. um, but I don't have a good... Uh, okay. Okay. Um, yes? So why do, you, why do you need this transformation to be holomorphic? Is this just differentiable at some level? It's okay. The reason you need it to be holomorphic is so that the Laplace operator remains the same in both settings. You should think of it as, as conformal, but conformal and holomorphic is the same here in, in two dimensions. So yes, uh, just, just a remark for your uh, question. Uh, for <laughs> your question. Uh, Pegos here, so Sumi-san, Pegos has a paper on the stability of the solitons. Oh, okay. Okay. Linear, linear stability. Linear stability. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's find the speaker again.